a lot that just said this one place. Um, there were a lot that split between two places. There were a couple that split between two places. A lot of time, and then there were some that if they were splitting, um, they would either split them equally and not leave the um, sort of that split up to bylaw. Um, and so it would be sort of set in stone of we're going to split it equally between a trust and CPA. Some of them actually, I think, put some of it to like a CPA or to their housing authority or something like that, um, or trust and general fund split equally. And so um, there weren't, I, I, I'm trying to remember, I don't think there were a lot that listed specific amounts because they chose to take the sort of even split or 100% to one location. Um, but we believed in looking at all of these that we had to declare something. Um, and we weren't sure, a, at least I wasn't sure, that um, a leaving it a split up to the bylaw that included, say, the trust as well as the capital stabilization and the others would fly in the legislature. Um, because then the bylaw could, in theory, say $10 to the trust and the rest to general, right? Um, so we thought if we wanted to leave that sort of um, flexibility as, as to a certain, you know, as to a certain percentage or an amount of the sort of remainder we had to, I, you know, I felt I had to put some number in there that guaranteed an amount to the trust. Um, and so that's why we put a number in. Um, okay. You know, I would say, I, 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 we don't know how much Anna will get back. You know, we were looking at 1.7 for 2021. I think Anna's, my vague memory is that none of the numbers were under 1 million a year. You're correct. Um, you know, and so we wanted to make sure the number to the trust was not a number that would be above anything <laughs> <laughs> we, we might see in any one year, right? If we're going to put a number in, which is why I suggested at the beginning, maybe one of the solutions to putting a solid number in is then adding into that section where it says, you know, de deposited in the capital improvement and general fund as allocated by bylaw, capital improvement, housing trust, and general fund as allocated by bylaw yeah. to give us that additional flexibility that says, you know, we know we picked in some sense a lowish number, but we're going to allocate the rest by bylaw to give that other flexibility. Um, I hope that yeah, that's your question. That whole idea made me feel much better about the 250, I must say. Um, I'm trying to remember if I had one. I had thought I had. No, I think I think it might just be that there was something here that I didn't know what it meant. And that would be number three in section two. Transfers of real property subject to an afford, no, I'm sorry, transfers made without additional consideration to confirm, correct, modify, or supplement a transfer previously made. I just don't know what you mean. I mean it's probably fine, but I don't know what it means. Uh, so it, the, I, I will say these five sections were in nearly every transfer act we special act we looked at. Um, so okay. what I'm going to say is I'm guessing that means that you know if you if you file a deed and you list the wrong name or the spelling the name of the person is spelled wrong, um, you know, and so you're then fixing the deed, but technically because the name of the person was spelled wrong, someone might say, oh, you actually transferred that. It would be something okay, like okay. that. That that would be my guess, um, but that's just a total guess. But that one was in, I think, every special act we it looked was, at. It was. It was. So yeah. some lawyer knows what it means, and it's important. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my interpretation of that one is similar to Mandy's. It's more of a a, a um, what's the nice way? I have to stop swearing in these meetings. Um, it's a it's a nicer way of saying that this is in case of error uh, versus anything else. Okay. Well. Um... If there aren't other questions, I guess my next question is, where is this in your process? Is there some, what do you, where do you go? Where do you want, where would you like us to go to help if that's an issue? So, What's up next? So where we are currently is that this is now being discussed by the finance committee. 
Um, what would be helpful for you all is, you know, I think some discussion amongst yourselves about whether you'd like a higher baseline number and st stay there or whether you'd like to do, I believe what Allegra first pitched, which was add the housing trust to the split, right? And kind of, it would still be regulate, like the percentage would still be by the bylaw, which we have not written yet, right? So, so one of the things that's been really important for us to do is to differentiate the special act and the bylaw. Um, so that that bylaw is just a sample that is very much not written yet, um, very much up for debate. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, but we didn't want to write an entire beautiful bylaw, which I think we can do um, before we know if the special act is going to get passed or not. So what, what would be really helpful is first for you all to think through whether you want us to bring that initial number higher, whether you want us to do a difference in the split, like what makes the most sense. Um, and then the second thing is, what would also be helpful is if you decide as a committee to write a letter of support to the council um, and the finance committee about this. We have it at finance. I believe it's only going to finance. I don't think it's going to CRC. Um, and then it comes back to the council. And I think I just froze again. So I'm sorry if you can't hear me anymore. I, we can still hear you even oh, though good. Okay. <laughs> sorry. And I know Nate has a question, but uh, Mandy, did I miss anything? Um, oh, once the council approves it, then we send it to the legislature. Um, ideally, we are looking at a relatively quick turnaround. We're hoping to have it to them in January. Okay. Then I, I guess the only other thing I would like to say is I sincerely hope that as we go through this process with you, whenever you come up to be writing the bylaw, you will come back and let us help you do that too. A hundred percent. Yes. Uh, Nate. Sure, thanks. So my understanding is that the trust is part of the town, so I don't think you need to name it separately. Okay. You know, it has powers established through, you know, statutory, um, you know, state law that we adopted locally. So it's, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a separate entity. You know, the housing authority is. It's, um, but I just had some questions too about the act. Have you, has any community had this long enough to know if there is other impacts, you know, uh, the effects of actually raising rental costs or other housing burdens. Um, that's one. And the other one is, is the first 200% exempt and then over that is charged or is it? Yes. You, you know, so yeah. So, okay. The, you know, the bylaw says something, but when I read the, when I read the act, I wasn't sure, but when I read the bylaw, it's clearer. And so, um, it's confusing. Is that, you know, is it just that the bylaw doesn't need to get that specific in terms of how, what, where, or, you know, what price point it applies to? Yeah, um, the, the, the reason is that it allows us in the bylaw, if for some reason we decide it needs to be 300% to change mm -hmm. that. Right, um, okay. And so, yeah, the bylaw, the bylaw is a little scary. This is why we were trying to explain this. And I think we're still honing our pitch clearly. Um, but the bylaw is a 2% total. And then what we do is in, or sorry, I screwed it up already. The special act is a 2% total. And then the bylaw exempts the first 200% of the average assessed or right. average sale price. So it's just the amount over. Yeah. And then it's owner, okay, okay. owner occupied. Right. Non owner occupied, it's on the full purchase price. Yeah. And then the you also define residential real property, right? So although that's mentioned in the bylaw, that again becomes a defined, I mean, in the act, that becomes a defined term in the bylaw. Right? Correct. Or you say real property interests. So, uh, so in, in the special act, the, as Anna said, the 2% is on any real property interest, not just residential. And so then we deal with all of those exemptions in the bylaw, mm -hmm. which we would then define what residential is versus commercial and right. stuff like that. Yeah. I just remembered another question. So does this have any, suppose that there's a sale of a duplex or a triplex or a something that's not just one owner occupying it does that come into this at all so it in our tax in our tax classification those are considered residential properties um, so they would count for this and that's something that we we can try to maneuver around um, depending on on where people land on this this question came up in finance yesterday but one of the things that comes up is do we want to charge this on large apartment complexes and somehow not on duplexes? And is that even possible? So um, if y'all don't know this, Mandy is a wizard at writing these, these bylaws. And so she managed to, to kind of help us sort this out a bit. 
Um, but this would take, it's gonna take some finagling. So I think that that's really important feedback for us to hear from you all is when we get to the bylaw part of this, and I recognize that it, it impacts the special act. So I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about it now, but that would be a conversation that's gonna be really important for us to have is what should be exempted and how we craft that to make sure that we're not making loopholes that are too big or too small, right? Like not loopholes, making exemptions. Got that. Yeah, that and are too big or I too. Small. One question would be how you define affordable housing or other type, you know, income limits. And so, yes. you know, sometimes it's by deed restriction. You have an AMI, which is a little fuzzy, and I don't know who calculates that. So, typically, when you know, when we're looking at inclusionary zoning or other mm -hmm. other measures, we we don't want to use a percentage that the town calculates on its own. We'd like to use a, a reference point like HUD or yeah. something else. And so. You know, the 100% also excludes voucher holders. So I don't know if you're considering how, you know, it, and those move, right? So, you know, that's not tied to a unit. Some are, but um, for the most part, they're, you know, the mobile vouchers can be in any dwelling unit. So I just wasn't sure if there's a consideration there, um, you know, in your definition of affordable, if it's, you know, um, you know, is it, is it the price? Is it the, you know, is it the price of the home or the income of the, resident that is the definition there um i think i need to find the which specific part yeah. are you so we are, are talking are about restrictions but um what do you well you mentioned you you have a definition for affordable in the bylaw and I'm the so act doesn't say anything about that doesn't say anything about that so really it's interesting the act is is quite generic the act is really generic Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so the I, act does mention affordable housing, but it it's it's in section two under the exemptions, um, and it's affordable housing restrictions. So, yeah, so, so that, okay, that's why I saw that. Right. Okay. Yeah. That 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 is part of the special act is any transfers of property that are subject to an affordable housing restriction, which is different than the bylaw that that has some other things in there that talk about affordable housing as not a restriction but as something else mm -hmm. if if we can unless there's something really critical somebody wants to say about the possible bylaw i'd like to not talk about the bylaw now it's not written it's not it's all we have to talk about is this and we have some other things we'd like to talk about too so well, i think well if it's okay is, to move on yeah no i guess ahead, what's interesting is you say affordable housing but you know it's a it's based on income and then typically someone do, can't spend more than 30 percent of their income and so you have to do some type of analysis to determine what that is you know where everything else is based on a sale price of the home not income and so you know, you're just bringing in a different metric so you're saying that we should consider an exemption based on income for folks i, I i'm not i don't know what i'm saying i'm just you know it's just you know if if you're like oh it's based on 100 percent of the area median income then you have to get the income from the 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 sellers, buyers, or whoever's living there, which is different than the sale price of the house. And so usually to verify that, you ask for taxes or pay stubs, and that becomes a lot more rigorous than the sale price. And that's all. So I don't know how that figure gets determined in this process. Um, you know, that that's all. It's just one of those things, you know, usually to make sure something's affordable, we ask for you know, possibly three years of of income verification. And then you you know, bank statements and it gets pretty, pretty rigorous. And it, I, I don't want to say intrusive, but it can be. Um, but it is. Right. But I think, I think still, is that not a consideration for writing a bylaw rather, or you're, or Nate, are you saying that something different should be in this? Um, no, no, I think it's just something to consider for the bylaw. You know, okay. in, the, and in the, in the act, if you mention affordable housing, then capital A affordable is always, you know, if it's, by the state, it's you know eighty percent AMI. Well, I, I think you know, Mandy's right. It only says the only place it's in here is about affordable housing restriction, restriction. which and is that's a with different the thing, and that's clear what that is if it is. So again, I think I would like to thank our two uh, town councilors for coming. Except Mandy, you have a very confused looking on your face. Do you have something you want to say? No, I was just looking at the bylaw to see where we mentioned some of this. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, it's really, like yeah. it's beyond really the definitions, and so I wasn't. I wasn't scan. I was scanning. <laughs> and all right. Scanning. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to cut off I something that really later. needs to be said. But yeah, also, no. I would like to move on if we can. And so, 
Thank so you thank all you so much. Yes, thank you both for thank coming. You, and, you know um, our emails. Um, please reach out, especially if you do land on a number or what you know the, as you're thinking about this. Um, please reach out. We this is a really a great time to have open dialogue as it's going through the different committees. So um, thank you all for considering supporting it and taking the time. When would you, if we were going to write a letter, when would you need it by? Probably the first meeting in January for the council is what I would say, because I think that's where sort of the goal is given restrictions on filing of bills at the state house. Yeah. I think that's what the finance committee was sort of talking about. Okay. And we would need feedback on, on num if you, we, we are happy to muddle through and look at numbers ourselves, but if you have specific feedback on numbers, it would be helpful to get that as soon as you can so that we can kind of think about what edits might need to be made um, as this goes through finance specifically. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks for your Thank time. You for your work. It's really important and we appreciate it. Ditto back. Yes. Thank at you. <laughs> Um, let's see. So we maybe need to have a conversation amongst ourselves before for which you can stay or leave. I don't know. Um, to whether to, to see whether we have some opinion about that seems like the possibilities are up the number that we get for sure or add the trust to the to the place where the bylaw gets to decide how to divide up the rest of it. And the other thing is, do we want to write a letter of support? Those are the two things I think we're thinking about. Ashley. Well, I'm happy to up the number and also um, <laughs> increase our percentage. Let's do both. But the other thing that I was thinking, and John brought this up in other th contexts too, but one unit is costing $500,000 to create. And I think we need a bigger discussion about why we're spending $500,000 on a unit. Because if you can look at um, what condos are going for in Amherst or the area, the lowest, the cheapest condo is about 200 to 250,000 and it's already existing and it's not, it's ready to move in. Why are we spending 500,000 on a new unit when we could buy two units, house two people or two families for exactly the same price? Why does everything have to be new is what I'm saying. Why is the focus, this is a larger conversation, but why is it always building? Why can't it be taking things that are already on the market that are lots less than 500,000 and it's a whole unit and it's ready to move in. Why aren't we buying things already made? Um, that seems like a good conversation to have at another time. And I expect that George Ryan has written it into our notes so we won't forget. Rob. I was gonna respond to that, but you're right. That's, that's a conversation for another time. I, I would, I, my, um, my, um, opinion I think is that is that 250 seems fine obviously I, I would like more but I think there the town has lots of priorities and and as a taxpayer in town you know I I, I recognize that uh, the capital budget needs to be funded so so and and you know it's not just um, annual capital expenditures it's these gigantic building products that we have, um, you know, we need to, we need to supplement our taxes some way. So, so I, I would be fine with, with 250, whatever, and then, and then a percentage of, of the remainder. Does somebody else have something to say about this particular thing? Does that mean that we are sort of in agreement with 250 and a percent of the remainder? Just as a straw poll, I'm going to see thumbs and then we'll do something more official, but can I just get an idea if we're all in the same place or we're in different places? I only see Paul not saying anything. Paul, do you want to say something? No, I, because this will be a council matter, I'll abstain on this one. So whatever the 
Oh, all right. So okay. That's what to do, sign. So can all I right. just say, I did a quick math. And what I mean by that is I used a calculator. And so I took the 1.7 million that was referenced and divided, nope, subtracted 250,000 from that and then did a third of what that would be. So that would put, so say the, you know, 250 plus a third based, you know, on that number roughly would put the total at around 730, 730,000, which would be about 43% of the entire number, if that makes sense. That was it. A, make, that was yes, I'm not sure that there's a guarantee that the bylaw would divide the remainder in, into thirds. Right. That would be a conversation that would happen when the bylaw is written in. It might be since the trust already got something that the thoughts wouldn't get a whole third of the remainder. I feel like that's a fight down the road to have when there, and when there's more information about what is the, we will have better numbers about what was the no, amount of money that this would actually have brought into the town coffers in mm -hmm. several years. So it won't be quite as much of a, but yes, that's, if it were a third, yes, that would be, that would be great. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I would, somebody said, go ahead. Um, I guess I understand that the bylaw is a different fight for a different day and nothing is guaranteed, but I would say we accept the 250 with the understanding that the bylaw, the intent of the bylaw um, is to split it in thirds, because I think otherwise we get kicked to the curb really fast and just get the 250. Um, so just, I mean, it, it holds no weight. It is not an, you know, it, it, it's not even a handshake, but it, I would, I would like that wording in our sort of suggestion to make sure that it's there when the bylaw gets written. <clears throat> Anybody have any comment about Reese's comment? Does anybody object to including that particular wording and, <clears throat> What, I mean, I think that that would mean we would say we are in support of the $250,000 amount for us and we want, we absolutely want the trust included as one of the three people who will get the remainder. That's kind of, yes, that needs to be in there. And in addition, we really hope that we'll get a whole third of it. Is that, am I getting it right? What, the, what your intent is, Risha and anyone else? I was I hoping, would, oh, sorry, go ahead, Risha. No, no, go ahead. I was sort of hoping that we'd say, we agree with the 250,000 if we are one third equal, um, if we get that one third equal share. And some caveat of like, that that's the intent, because we know there's voting and, and negotiation and blah, 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 but that that's sort of the understanding going in is that that's where it is. That's what we would like to see because the, yeah, because we don't have whatever we're saying now is not going to, the bylaw thing is a whole different thing, but we, okay. Any, any other thoughts, comments, somebody in the audience has their hand raised. Um, two people do. Two people in the audience have their hands raised now. Okay. Let's hear those things. And then I will hope that we can move on because we're getting behind schedule. Alisa. Thank you. I just wanted to say that buying existing property just changes which low-income person gets to live there. It doesn't add to the stock in response to Ashley's question. And I think the object is to add to the amount of low-cost housing or lower-cost housing, not, well, not just which who gets to live there. Because the people, the people who live in $250,000 condos are not wealthy people. But they bought it 40 years ago or 30. Not necessarily. You don't know that. Okay, let's, we have, we'll have a comment here, but not a conversation, please. Because right. I would hear what you said. We've heard what Ashley said. And now, if that's okay with folks, we can hear what John wants to say and then hopefully we'll move on we'll move on 
Um, <clears throat> something else occurred to me. Um, under the trust bylaw, theoretically, we could also have a role in bonding expenditures. So for example, if Wayfinder or somebody else comes to us and say, we need a million dollars to do something and we don't have a million dollars, in principle, if we have a regular income of $250,000 a year, we could bond a million dollars and have that guaranteed income to pay it off year after year. Now, I think that works, but I'm not sure that it does. Maybe Paul or Nate would have something to say about that. But if it does, it dramatically increases the capability of the trust in helping to fund projects. We're never going to fund an entire project. Don't misunderstand me. Um, you know, we're never going to buy a single unit because that's silly. But what we can do which we've done in the past is demonstrate to the state, which is the major funder directly or indirectly for the projects that we're interested in, that we have skin in the game. And if we have this capacity to actually bond larger amounts to commit to a project over a 10 or 20 year period that would be created by having this guaranteed income, um then that could be a real game changer for the trust that's true wow that's an interesting thought i think it only means more more definitely do we want this to happen so that we have the chance of some regular income and that we want and, and i think i think we can write something as a letter of support the way that erica described it that sat, that I believe is okay with what that in honors the intent of what Risha said and what Allegra said. And does this sound right to folks? Are we ready to say yes to this? And do I have to do some formal vote thing? Or maybe I guess. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, okay, so sorry, the, Erica, yeah, I mean, if we think we'd want this to be, you know, the trust to recommend this, I think a vote would be good. Um, yeah so and then I you know, the language, just... it doesn't have to be specific language but just you know what we would like to have added um and then to john's point yeah i think if we have a steady stream the trust can borrow you know it require a two-thirds vote so you know if it's exceeding a certain ratio of our of the trust assets it takes a you know a super majority vote um but i think that's something that could happen so it does you know opens up possibilities of funding larger amounts um so um all those in favor of writing a letter of support to the finance committee and the town council in support of this proposal with a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar guarantee for the trust and the trust in amongst the three people that will the money will be shared for and we hope that it will be shared equally among the three other parties is that all the uh, if so, no, I'm supposed to do a vote. Erica, how do you vote? Yes, I vote. So, so we, if that's the motion, we have a second. Sorry. Oh, sorry. So, I second the motion. <laughs> is there any additional conversation that we haven't already had? Oop, uh, George has his hand up. George. Sorry, I need to unmute. Um, the uh, note taker needs the language a little bit clearer, or maybe we can get it clearer later. But at the moment, he's struggling to get uh, just a clear statement. So um, um, you have a motion; it's been seconded. At the moment, I have a motion that a letter that uh, a letter supports the town council with a guarantee of two hundred fifty thousand to the trust. Anyway, please just uh, spell it out clearly so I can type it up. A guarantee of 250000 to the trust and um, the remaining funds collected each fiscal year shall be, no, I don't care where they're deposited, shall be, uh, oh, shall be deposited in the town of Amherst capitalization improvement fund and general fund and housing trust fund as allocated by bylaw. We anticipate the bylaw or we, Help me, Erica, you do the next sentence. <laughs> no, certainly. Um, 
uh, after you said the three entities equally should go after oh, that. equally very good as uh, equally as allocated by the bylaw george as did that work as hopefully stated in the bylaw i will get the more precise language but at least have a general sense of it um from you okay okay thank you so uh we have a motion that has been seconded George, your hand is still up. Is that just because you didn't take it down? OK. Uh, and so we should now vote on that. I'm going to go around the way people are on my screen, starting with Erica. Yes. Um, Allegra. Yes. Paul. Abstain. Rob. Yes. Risha. Yes. Sid. Yes. Ale A Ashley. Yes. And myself, yes. So we have everyone yes with one abstention. Thank you very much. Can, can I just add, I had understood that they wanted two things from us and one was an informal communication of what we just talked about um, in terms of the money split. And the second was a formal letter of Support, support that would be ready for January. But I think they want the numbers as quick as possible so they can do further negotiations, et cetera. Okay, that's, pro that's probably true. And so one of us will, I can email them and tell them what we just said. They're still here. They, yeah. They're I'm still ahead. here, then they heard. <laughs> okay, I'm obviously not, I'm getting hot trying to do this. That, um, um, all right. Is there any anything else about this particular about this particular issue, or can we move on? Since we're kind of behind, the next thing on our agenda was uh, kind of an overview of the CPAC meeting, and I think I might even. Well, we uh, hopefully everyone got to see what what we submitted. Uh, and I hope if anybody had if anybody had any questions or thoughts or is there anything anybody wants to say about our submission, which tried to walk a line between saying the other projects that you're funding, yes, they're great housing projects, yes, fund them, but don't cut us out entirely because we are where the new things often start and you don't want to make it so they can't start. That's a two second summary, but um, do people have thoughts or questions? Some of us, at least at least Erica and I listened to the public comments just before our meeting now. And I just a quick, uh, they were all sort of either in favor of affordable housing in general, the field at Fort River, and more specifically, many of them were about uh, support for the Ball Lane project, the home ownership project. And a lot of those were from people right, or, right who were in the area, um, abutters, or at least close to abutters. So, and what they're doing in there, how they're figuring out what they're going to do, I don't know. My understanding was that they will talk about it some tonight after their meeting, I think last till nine. They will, are now right now having some conversations, but I believe they decided they might do straw poll voting, but I don't, I don't really know what's going to happen next. But we will find out at some point who they funded and how much. Are there questions? Because I'd like to not, I'd like to not, I'd like to try to have enough time for the other, these updates, especially since I see that Dave is here in, um, as an attendee, and we were hoping to have him talk to us about some things. So, I mean, I think quickly, uh, Carol, I just want to say, yeah, you know, the there are many asked of the CPA committee this year, and you know, a lot more money than is available. And so, the committee is really trying to determine how best to prioritize and recommend proposals. And so, you know, the trust ha hasn't, and I know the historical commission didn't either, you know, in its memo, prioritize or rank proposals. And so. The CPA committee hasn't necessarily asked that of the trust, but it's something if, you know, if we wanted to discuss it now would be a good time to, um, it could be at the next meeting, but, you know, uh, just the housing proposals themselves, um, you know, is probably twice the budget of the CPA uh, this year. And so, 
uh, you know, then there's many other proposals. So I think the, the committee is really trying to find the best way to, to manage that. And, you know, we haven't, you know, I, part of this discussion was also the trust has some money, there's ARPA money. And so, you know, have we, you know, um, for instance, Valley CDC said in their proposal, CPA proposal, they'd likely come to the trust and ask for $250,000 for Ball Lane. And, you know, perhaps wayfinders might ask for some, but we haven't, the trust hasn't discussed, you know, would we not seek funding this year or withdraw our CPA proposal? You know, would we allocate, you know, half a million dollars from the trust to support these projects? And I'm not sure CPA is asking, but I think the trust may, you know, they might, right? So I think it'd be good for the trust to talk about it, if not tonight, then at the next meeting, you know, where we feel about, you know, putting our, our the money up um, this year for these projects. And, you know, because realistically, the CPA committee just can't fund, you know, every project that's been asked of it. So, uh, you know, there's, you know, and, and we can talk about what's an appropriate local match or share at this point in projects. So, you know, you know, does Valley or Wayfinders need as much as, as they've asked and do they need just a certain amount to show a local match at this point in the project and would they need to come back at a future year or years to secure more funding if necessary. And so, um, you know, I, I just want to put that out there that, you know, part of the conversation and some of this agenda item, that's what I was considering, right? Because, um, you know, one, one or two proposals, maybe three proposals is more than all the CPA has for funding. So, you know, they, can, they can't even fund one proposal in its entirety, let alone all the ones that are received. Um, all right, um, so do we want, I, Anybody have any comments about what Nate just said? Well, I have one comment, which is that I don't think we should withdraw our proposal. So that was one of the things that you wanted us to consider. I don't think we should withdraw our proposal. Um, the CPA did ask additional questions, which were raised at the first meeting after Carol presented, which was to all the proposals, I'm sure we all got the question, which was, could we do with less uh, and how much less? or could we postpone projects? But I think one of the things that we all discussed prior to submitting our proposal was that um, this funding allows us to have funds available uh, during the year that either the CPA, um, you know, you can't, you can't go to the CPA for, and that we can, you know, use that as seed projects at times where there may not be other funds available. So I think if we withdraw it, I think it limits our ability, especially knowing that probably, you know, see the CDC is going to come to us for at least $250,000. And that, you know, maybe we could provide just a little bit of funding to the um, East Street and Belchertown Road, though, there wasn't anybody who spoke up for that this evening. So that was a little interesting. Um, so I'm just concerned about us. If the, if the, the conversation is about withdrawing, I don't believe we should. Um, they can make a decision about how much they want to give us. Um, but I think we shouldn't withdraw the proposal. Other comments? Sure, thanks, yeah, Eric. I wasn't, I wasn't saying that or recommending that we should. I just wanted to put it out there that, you know, it may be that the CPA committee might come back and ask if you, you know, they ask, like, could you accept less money? They might be like, well, what if you don't get funded at all? Um, they, you know, they haven't asked that yet. But I guess I personally feel kind of reluctant to answer the questions they haven't yet asked. I just, I don't know. I mean, are we've answered the questions that they have asked of us, I think, as well as, I mean, if somebody has comments about what we said and thinks we should have said something different and thinks we should now say something different, uh, please speak. But I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't, Anyway, that's just me. I don't feel inclined to answer questions that I, we haven't been asked. <clears throat> Somebody else want to say something? Do we then at this moment need to do any, is there anything that anyone wants us to do right now relative to overview of the CPAC meeting as opposed to moving on to the updates that we're going to receive? It's made from, we're going to receive from at least Dave. Can you remind me of when we expect a decision? If I remembered, I would. Uh, do, Nate, do you know? Paul, do you uh, know? So, 
the, the CPA committee makes recommendations to town council. You know, they don't, they're not, um, you know, and then the decision is then voted. So even if CPA makes a recommendation, the council may, you know, weigh some options as well. So the CPA usually likes to have the recommendations done, if not by the end of the year in January, and then council could vote, you know, in this, you know, spring, winter, it depends on how their, the budget process works. And so, um, you know, a final vote may not be until it could be March or April. Uh, funding isn't available until July 1 of next year. Okay, thank you. Which again, that, that brings me back to, if we were to remove our proposal, we're talking about funding for next year, and that was gonna really limit us um, we, you know, as I said, we have 600,000 right now. We don't know how fast that could go. Um, remembering back when we first worked with the town with, um, to, to buy the Belchertown Road property, um, we had to have those funds available um, and we had to move very quickly. And I think, you know, if we don't consider the future, we constantly talk about pipeline projects. And if we don't have that funding available, it's going to really limit us. Um, so I'm, I think we need to consider that as well. So I'm inclined to move on unless someone objects. Please uh, bring Dave into the room and I will turn the meeting over to Erica. Thank you. Uh, and I, one, I, I was remiss in not thanking George for taking the minutes. Um, so thank you, George, for taking the minutes. Um, Dave, if you can join us, you're the first uh, to provide an update. Um, I think you have some uh, very good news, uh, it seems, from the town on some of these projects. And so we're very excited to have you here and give us an update on all three of these projects or two projects in, in the ARPA funds using for housing initiatives. Sure, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I would be remiss if I could, just because I've been listening for the last 10, 15 minutes. I actually came from the CPAC meeting um, so just if you're not aware, there tonight is all about um, the public forum, and then they did their straw polling. So I don't know if that was kind of brought over to you tonight. So the straw polling just really gives the other members of CPAC and staff an under you know a general understanding of of kind of you know strengths and weaknesses of proposals and questions that uh, members of CPAC have. So. They are going to meet again. Uh, they've got a pretty rigorous schedule. They're going to meet again next Thursday. So um, as Nate said, I think it'll be a few meetings before they they coalesce around their recommendations and then a memo to the town council. Um, uh, but as Nate said, I just did want to re reiterate that, you know, part of our job as staff is to work with you, work with the, the CPAC, to kind of understand available funding, priorities, et cetera. And as Nate said, uh, I believe there's $8.5 million worth of proposals this year. And I think we have about 1.8 million, maybe 2 million, if we stretch things a little bit to actually allocate if all of the dollars were, were allocated. So um, there's gonna be need to be some hard decisions for CPAC in their recommendations to the town council. And, and I, for one, would, would likely probably come back to you in, in the next you know, number of weeks or in the next month to kind of discuss you know, kind of what town funds are available and what um, trust funds are available. And I, I heard your discussion about keeping money in reserve and I, I applaud that, um, but at the same time, part of the reason the trust has funds is to seed projects that are in the pipeline. And right now we have two very exciting projects, Wayfinders Project and Valley CDC. So um, I was not here for the earlier part of your, your conversation, but um, you know, I would hope we would, we would look favorably on those. I will say, um, you know, the town has partnered with, with Wayfinders on East Street School and, and Belchstown Road with the trust, as you know, um, the two properties combined are probably worth a million dollars, and that is a, a a gift to the project we've already made. Wayfinders, as you know, has come has come in with a one point eight million dollar request, which is a very and my um, I may be wrong on this, but that might be the largest request 
that um, has been made to CPAC since we adopted the CPAC in 2003, uh, if the trust, excuse me, if the CPAC were to recommend that to town council. So that's a very significant commitment on the part of the project. And again, you know, we've been working with, with Wayfinders uh, from the get-go on that since they were awarded the, uh, the project. But um, so there's going to be some hard decisions to make. Um, and I think, um, you know, we might need, staff might need, need to come back to you to, to kind of discuss that more. So, so anyway, why don't I jump to um, start with, um, yeah, the exciting news. I don't know if you've discussed anything related to the VFW project. Um, I'm happy to give you a quick overview of that. I, I believe Nate might have sent you the PowerPoint and the memos and other associated documents from the town council meeting on Monday night. But, um, you know, um, at Paul's urging staff um, about probably a year ago um, uh, with, with some, you know, real directed focus, uh, began to, to look around uh, as, as thoroughly as we could for a site for a permanent shelter. Um, this is not an easy task, as you know, with the real estate market in Amherst and zoning and um, protected land and college and university land. And we we started with about five or six sites and began to kind of do our due diligence on each one of those sites. You all know one of those sites was the, uh, I, I guess most people refer to it as the former hot pot site down in East the East Village. And we looked hard at that and for a number of reasons, um, uh, in particular, that the, the building was condoized was one of the main reasons we did not uh, think that was a good good move. Uh, we, we, we moved on in our process and we uh, eventually landed on, on, on the Main Street site of VFW. We knew that the VFW uh, had been closed uh, during the pandemic and, and there was a possibility it wouldn't reopen. So we you know, quickly opened a dialogue with the leadership there, had some very fruitful conversations, did an appraisal, and um, you know, fast forward to uh, uh, November, and Paul was able to feel confident in the agreement and uh, was able to sign a purchase and sale agreement. We are slated to close. If all goes well with the town council, we'll close in the middle of January on the property. It's uh, one acre. Um, the zoning is very favorable to uh, to a creative uh, project, which we hope will will allow us to. Uh, again, um, bring together a lot of funding to create a, a, a permanent site for a shelter, uh, supportive services, we hope, on the first floor, and then um, permanent supportive housing on the second and third stories of the building. Um, it's gonna take a couple of years to get done, some millions of dollars to, to bring it all together and local and regional and state partners. Um, so, I might have missed something, Paul or Nate, but that was the quick summary. We're really excited about the opportunity. Again, I can't say enough about the, the VFW leadership. Of course, they are closing, they've closed their building, but they will continue to meet in town. And um, we hope to provide um, veteran, some of the units in the second and third floor to veterans who need um, uh, housing and, and that kind of help. I'd just like to add two things, Dave. One is that this was a town council uh, priority and one of their goals uh, for me last year. And we had a unique opportunity that we recognized with having ARPA funds. So early so in November of last year, we allocated a substantial, about 10% of our ARPA funds to achieve this goal. So um, we got one step of the goal, which is a piece of land that seems to be suitable. So we've got a long, that's the first step and that's an important first step, but we've got a long ways to go. So Paul did um, set aside $1 million for this purpose and uh, the, the appraisal was 775. We will be closing at that figure. The building itself is really a teardown. We have no intention of using the building for sheltering that would frankly uh, not meet any local or state codes to do so. So uh, the building will come down. We will, um, after the first of the year and once we close, we will we'll create a kind of a schedule of, of next actions. I could foresee some of those being uh, some preliminary design uh, for what could take place there. And then we would move forward with demo of the building as soon as possible. We will you know, be a short-term, um, uh, uh, owner of, of a building that we'd like to see down just for safety and other purposes. 
Um, building demo is not inexpensive these days. Um, I would not be surprised if demoing that building uh, may be in the 75 to $150,000 range, but don't quote me on that, but I think that's probably <laughs> a safe range. Um, so we would love to assemble, um, you know, uh, um, interested parties from committees and boards and 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 uh, our our partners at Craig's Doors and some of the the players that you all know in the Valley CDCs and the Wayfinders and the Home Cities and others and and begin to vision a little bit about what could be on this site. I've already contacted DHCD. They're very aware of of our actions and supportive of of where we're headed. There are some other models that are happening out in in other parts of the Commonwealth where this is being done. Um, in particular, um, I believe in Quincy, Mass, there is a project that has very similar um, um, components to it. So, um, so we're looking forward to a, kind of a robust visioning. And then, um, as I said, it's going to take a considerable amount of funding and um, a lot of hard work to get to the next couple of stages. So happy to take any questions. Or any, questions? Well, yeah. <laughs> any questions or comments? I, well, I just want to say my comment. Congratulations. Oh. This is wonderful. It's congratulations for all of us at Amherst. This is really a, a wonderful project. And it's something that is also really important to us because we're really looking from you know people who are unhoused all the way to um, home ownership. So this is great. Allegra has her hand up. Oops, sorry, Allegra. Oh, that's OK. Um, no, I just I wanted to echo the congratulations. I think it's been something that the town has been talking about and working on since i don't know like last last may or so i think the task force formed um and you know i i, I guess my questions are just one will so if if the one million was allocated for the the shelter it would some of that be able to go towards either the demo or construction costs yes okay yeah that, that's our hope but we haven't had extensive conversations with paul but paul mm -hmm. controls the arpa money and 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 i rob mora who is our building commissioner and, and works closely with 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 me and paul and nate um um you know we would we would formulate a plan to look at both the demo of the building essentially the clearing of the site, preparing the site, we would survey the site um, and some of those due diligence steps to basically um, prepare it for some sort of RFP process, similar to what we did with the East Street School. Um, we would uh, possibly use some of that ARPA funding to do some preliminary design work as well so that we could present it in the most favorable way and hopefully one of our partners as again, as I said, wonderful partners like Wayfinders and Valley CDC and Home City and others in the region um, might be encouraged to partner with us uh, to create something pretty special here, just you know, a, a couple of blocks down from, from our, uh, our, our town center. And, and I think this has been a goal or a, a dream for many, many years uh, for both Craig stores, but the town in general, so. A long time coming, but we're happy that it's here today. Today, yeah. And so, would it be kind of a almost like public part private partnership, and that maybe some of the services are being provided not by town staff directly, but by say Craig's Doors or um, Elliot or somebody else coming in, or or am I getting ahead of us? Yeah, I don't. I, the town will. I don't think the town will be in the business of providing the services. We probably mm -hmm. want to contract with somebody, or you know, get state grants or something like that to. Um, the state has been investing pretty heavily in this field. So I think partnering with people who know what they're doing is really important. And, they're, and CSO, for instance, has a ton of money right now to do this kind of work. So that's a, a, a natural partner on the service side of things, not the development side of things. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And and again, I think we use the East Street and, and Biltstown Road models. You know, we worked with the trust and, and um, you know, aggressively went after some land that we thought made sense in that village center. And in this case, we aggressively went after this piece of property close to our downtown on bus route um, with town water, town sewer. Um, and, and really, once we gain site control, which we will in January, 
um, then we can package this up and hopefully present it in such a way that we can get uh, both a development partner, but also partners for uh, services. And as Paul said, we're we're not likely to be the service providers, but Craig's Doors could be one of those service providers, and Elliot Services and other folks who do that good work in our in our region. So, so very exciting. Um, and, and I guess the hard work now we got to roll up our sleeves and and really get to work here. So. Um, well, any way we can help and support it, um, absolutely. This is this is a wonderful and exciting project thank that you. we'll support. Absolutely, yeah. We we are going to reach out to you and and many others. And we've had Paul and I and, and the council, I think, have had very good feedback from the community and and regional providers as well. So we're excited about it. So stay tuned on that. Um, let me see. Um, Hickory Ridge, a quick update on Hickory Ridge. Um, so um, I think the first thing to remember is that the town just uh, got site control of Hickory Ridge in March of 2022. So although we've been talking about Hickory Ridge for a couple of years, it took a long time, no fault of the towns, but uh, took a long time to tee this up and line it up and actually have us have site control. So that happened in March. My goal has always been to complete, a, uh, and I've told this to the council, um, to complete a comprehensive plan of the property. That plan will include, um, you know, full due diligence on the on the 150 acres. That means survey work, wetlands work, um, you know, uh, delineating floodplains, any natural resource areas. Um, we are doing an ecological restoration plan that will be part of that comp plan. We're also doing some modeling work uh, with a, a, a landscape architecture firm to really look at what, um, what the, the property can support. Um, we know, you know, although 100, I think I've said this to you before, but I'll say it again, it, it, it bears repeating that although it's 150 acres, um, there's a very small uh, window of developable land. And to be honest, you can see that when you drive by on West Pomeroy Lane, what you see is pretty much what you get in terms of developable land that won't be solar. So let me say a little bit about solar. There will, of the 150 acres, there'll be 26 acres of solar. We're working with a partner that uh, came with the project, if you will, that's AMP Energy. Um, so when we bought it, AMP had already signed on board with the previous owners. And so we are partnering, if you will, now with AMP Energy to develop 26 acres of solar. Um, and that will be on some of the land north of the Fort River. That is a, it's about a 6.2 megawatt project. The town will see, will not be an off taker on the project. We decided, um, well, AMP, let me back up. AMP needed uh, one off taker for all of the energy. And we simply did not have that much need for uh, green energy. So, Instead, the city of Springfield will be the off taker on the project, which is actually we see as a win for Springfield uh, being able to um, uh, lessen their carbon footprint and um, green their municipal and other uh, energy needs down in Springfield. We will benefit through a pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes. So the project will bring in, um, I don't have the figures right in front of me here at home, but uh, approximately sixty-five to seventy thousand dollars in a payment in lieu of taxes every year for the the value of the uh, solar array on twenty-six acres. I say the solar project um, is uh, an important part of this project. It is uh, almost a full-time job right now getting this solar project permitted, approved, <laughs> um, and and going. They would like to break ground in January. That's how quickly this is going. And it is taking um, parts of me and and our building commissioner and his staff, the planning staff, to get it going. It is a very we want to do it right. We want to do it uh, well, and we want to make sure that AMP follows all of the zoning and and planning and uh, conservation regulations. So it is a very it's going to be a very intense period here. Uh, they will probably take three to four months to construct the array, and that will take up 26 acres, as I said. We then kind of 26 acres. 
26 of the of the of the um, 150 acres. It's important to recognize too that the town never would have been able to purchase the land. So I said there's there's land along um, Pomeroy Lane where the clubhouse is and the parking area is. That's pretty much the buildable land. Call it five to seven acres of land, if generously, if you will. The only other land that was developable was across the river. Um, and that's the 26 acres that will be solar. And two things to remember about that. One is we never would have been able to purchase the land if the solar had not been part of the project, we would not have been able to afford the land. We were able to purchase it for $520,000, which is a, a pretty uh, 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 large uh, uh, bargain sale. The land would have been worth without solar north of $2 million. So the solar is essentially paying, if you will, for the town to, to purchase the land at this lower value. You might also ask, well, we gave up, did we give up 26 acres of buildable land for housing or some you know, residential use or other use? And the answer to that is no. Um, um, there was no way to permit anything but solar north of the brook, the Fort River. Uh, it would have been impossible to get subdivision roads across the Fort River. So the solar project is using an existing bridge. They will build the entire solar project uh, crossing one bridge. There's seven bridges on the property. Only one of them is able to support, it will be slightly improved, and that they'll, they'll build the entire project using that one bridge. So we didn't give up anything, if you will, uh, in terms of buildable land. And had we not had the solar as part of the project, we never would have gotten the bargain sale at 520. So we're, we're, we're completing the um, comprehensive plan that will look at housing. It will look at a number of uses for the frontage along Pomeroy Lane. And, and I'll be perfectly frank, there are a number of potential uses there. There is a, a potential for housing uses and we're looking at high density, medium density, low density, we're also looking at community buildings. Um, there is a, a great need, as you know, for a, a South Amherst fire station site. Um, we are modeling whether a, a South Amherst fire station could, could fit there. Um, we're also looking at other community buildings that may fit there as well. So, so this is all part of our comprehensive plan is to look at all of those potential uses. And some of them may be able to fit side by side on the available frontage. So. Why don't I stop there? We hope to have that comprehensive plan done in February or March and would present it to the town via the Housing Trust, Conservation Commission, um, uh, Town Council, of course. So maybe I should stop there. I get, I get pretty excited about Hickory. But happy to take questions or, or comments. Well, I think you know what our interest is yes. and uh, one of the areas, especially um, affordable housing for elders, um, that was one area that we also see that there's a big gap in uh, in terms of uh, Amherst. So um, we, I think, will be very interested in knowing um, what the plan will be in terms of the use. And I know there's lots of competition, um, but I also remember, I think it was a bubble exercise and there was a lot of support for affordable housing in that exercise, as I remember, sort of a dashboard. Um, so yeah, we um, did we did a very um, um, a nice um, piece on our website on the Engage Amherst uh, section. Um, and I know there were a couple hundred comments that came in. Rihanna Sunred, our, uh, who, who oversees that part of our website, um, worked with staff, Ben Brager and others to really elicit hundreds of comments and they came in over a, a number of months. And so all of those will be incorporated into our comprehensive plan. And we got, we got wonderful comments across the spectrum um, from zip, could you put zip lines there, an amphitheater, community gardens, affordable housing, um, mini golf, dog park. I mean, it. if you go to the site, I believe you can still see many of those comments. And so they're all there. And yes, we saw a strong interest and support for looking at affordable housing there. So that has not been lost. I just wanted to echo that we've only owned it since March. And so that's when our timeline started, even though we've been talking about it for a while. 
Thank you, Dave. So the last area that we've asked you to comment on is the ARPA funding for housing initiatives. And I think that will help us as well uh, in terms of thinking about our priorities uh, and how we continue to partner. I mean, we're part of the town. And so um, honing in on what your priorities are, what our priorities are and how we can work together is really important. Yeah, and I think, you know, happy to have Paul uh, chime in here as well, but, but as, as I think of things, and I've been talking to Paul and talking with Nate and talking with Sean Mangano, our, our finance director about this, um, you know, I, um, I guess I would say I, I was never good at chess, but I do like to, to play three-dimensional community development. So, so the bottom line is, I think it's very exciting how many projects in affordable housing we have going right now. Paul did set aside in the roughly $12 million that we got in ARPA funds, he did set aside $1 million for the sheltering need identified and $1 million in affordable, for affordable housing. And so as I look at that three-dimensional chess, I think, or three-dimensional community development, I think of things like, you know, what do we have currently going? What's, what's happening in town? And so, you know, we have Valley CDC doing their wonderful project at 134 Northampton Road, which, you know, has received funding and support. And I, I hope we're keeping our fingers crossed given climate and whatnot that they have the funding that they can proceed with. We, we, the town, with the help of the trust, partners with Wayfinders on East Street School and Belchertown Road. And they have put in that request, as I said, 1.8 million to CPAC and CPAC is doing its thing. But CPAC is not, in my mind, doing its thing in a vacuum, right? We, you, the, the trust, the, the staff, we are, we are part of this, this um, uh, com, you know, uh, um, community decision on, on how do we help move these projects forward. So we have Wayfinders at East Street School, Belchertown Road. We have this wonderful project with Valley CDC up at Matusco, Ball Lane. We are fully investigating Strong Street now, and I don't know if you talked about that. I think it might be next on your agenda, but we're looking, we're, we're now through some preliminary wetlands work and rare species work on Strong Street. We now, as of Monday night, you know, the, the council has not uh, yet voted on v, the VFW site. They don't need to vote on the funding, but they do need to vote on the acquisition. That will happen on um, uh, December 19th. So we, we now have Wayfinders in process, that wonderful project, Valley CDC, VFW site, which will include sheltering as well as permanent supportive housing. We have Strong Street in play. So as we, as, as, as I work at Paul's direction um, and with Nate and with our building commissioner and planning folks, we kind of look at that, at that uh, $1 million in ARPA funds and say, how is it best allocated among and between these projects to, to move them forward? So I don't have a specific recommendation or number tonight, but that is an ongoing conversation that we're having with Paul and with Nate, with Nate in the room, and also with our finance director, Sean Mangano. Um, our, a million dollars sounds like a lot, but in fact, when you look at what Valley CDC needs, what Wayfinders needs, and what we'll need for the VFW site and potentially Strong Street, we know that these, these numbers don't go as far as we'd like. So there's not enough funding to, to do all of these projects, but, but um, I, I guess I would also say that you know, the, kind of a bird in the hand. We've got Wayfinders, wonderful project, Valley CDC, a wonderful project, and now potentially VFW, uh, a project that is not as far along as the other two, but certainly has some momentum. So I, 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 think, I honestly think um, Hickory is a little, you know, you talked about pipeline earlier, Erica. Hickory is potentially in the pipeline, but not in the near term. It's farther down the road. I'll yeah, stop there. yeah, so a couple of things on that. One, one is we there we haven't mentioned the um, development that's going on that include affordable housing units as part of it. That's that's happening based on private developers. These are designated affordable housing units, um, but there's also a sort of certain level of staff capacity. Um, you know, we're, we have some turnover going on in the second floor. How many projects can we reasonably manage over time? Um, so I think that's that's an important piece for us as well. And the third thing I want to mention is that the council is looking at the goals for the town manager for me for next year. They're having that discussion now. 
If there are priorities you think that they should be including in those goals, you should definitely communicate with them probably individually sooner than later. Um, because that's, you know, if, if it's important for them to say what they want, you know, because they're the elected leaders of the town. If they say we really want a shelter, that's what we work on. If they say we want more moderate income housing, that's what we work on. And so having that sort of sort of prioritization is really important for us as we allocate our time. Um, so yeah, happy to take questions on that. I just wanted to give kind of a flavor of how many projects, it's exciting, right? It's very exciting to have, to have these projects. We know there's a tremendous unmet need out there. We know these projects also, as Paul said, we have projects that are happening in private developments like on U Drive South, um, um, on Aspen Heights that just uh, was completed over on uh, uh, Route 9, um, uh, on the uh, south side of Route 9. Um, so we have, we have rental uh, projects that are happening. And then we have Valley, of course, Wayfinders Project, but then we also have Valley CDC looking at affordable home ownership. So it's, it's exciting. I mean, it's exciting. It can be a little overwhelming from a staff standpoint to kind of how do we support all of these projects and keeping them moving forward. Some of them will, many of them will need to move through the 40B process. So that's a big lift for staff. Um, so yeah, happy to, hand up. Yeah, happy to take questions. Carol, go ahead. Um, I have to figure out how to lower my hand now. <laughs> I, I guess that I'm, it's true. There are so many things going on. And one of the things that I keep wondering is how do we collaborate about it? It feels like we're in these separate silos. Here's the housing trust doing something. Here's CPAC doing something. Here's the town staff doing something. And how do we, I mean, it seems like it would be better if all of those things really got to figure out together what's the best way to use everything. Like CPAC is trying to figure out what to do, but maybe it makes a difference what they do about what you all are going to do with this money or what the trust is going to do with whatever its money. It just feels... Well, it I just, I'm just, so, my question is how, what's the best way that we can do this together for the best outcome? So ultimately it's the town council that sets the direction for the town. They're the elected, the chief elected officials for the town. Okay. They have to set the guidelines for CPA. They are the ones who finally make the decision for any of these projects. If we're purchasing land, they have to vote to accept the land. All the projects funnel through the staff on the second floor through Dave's team. So anything to do with affordable housing goes through the same people but there are different people, there are different committees that have different responsibilities. And, and I, I guess I would just add, Carol, that 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 was kind of what I was alluding to in my opening remarks about CPA, the CPA process. You know, we've we've worked, we the town, that you you the trust are part of the town. I, I know it may yeah. appear, you know, at least maybe, I don't know, to some on paper or whatever on an org chart that you're not, but you are, you are part of the town. Yeah, yeah. And, and we, we help, you know, staff your, your work. And, and I know, you know, and I see John is still uh, here tonight, but, you know, over the past three to five years, we've worked very uh, successfully, I think, together in, in collaborative efforts that have resulted in some of the projects we're talking about. So I think we need to build on that. But a lot of it comes down to, as you said, Carol, is how do we, how do we decide, at least in the short term, how some of this funding is best applied to the Valley CDC project, the Wayfinder project, to, to the VFW project. And you know, the town has some resources that we control. You have some funding that came to you through CPAC. And I understand you want to, you want to make sure you can have some of that funding to be nimble and, and flexible between CPAC rounds, but also. I think part of the reason you have funding is to apply it to good projects. And here mm -hmm. we have two good projects before us and we know there's not gonna be enough CPAC funding. There is just, there is no way they can fund all those projects even if they bond some of them. We also have to be a little careful with bonding. Bonding seems, oh, easy. We can just do that. Well, there are implications of bonding more projects town-wide, but also 
every time we bond a project, it takes money out of the annual um, funds that are available for new projects. Next time, right? Uh, we, we need to make sure that bonding, um, that debt load for CPAC is not too high. So, yep. so I think that's why I suggested that let's see what CPAC does tonight with their um, straw polling. I'm going to get together with Sean Mangano and we'll, of course, talk with Paul and take a look at the ARPA money that we've been discussing, some of the CPAC money. And I, and I, I would, you know, hope that we could come back to you with, with some suggested paths forward. And it might need to be yeah. before, before the holidays. I, I don't know if you have another meeting scheduled, but we might need to add one meeting before the holidays or, or shortly thereafter to kind of have a follow-up conversation. Sure. Okay. And, that, and that's going to include- um, Thank you. Think, sorry, Carol. Um, absolutely. Thank you. Um, that includes also the 500,000 that you guys still have from CPAC, because mm -hmm. I remember mentioning that yes. at the last CPAC meeting. Um, yes, but I think, absolutely. yes, having a conversation uh, in terms of priorities and how we can best maximize and still ensure that we have some flexibility because we're talking about not only this year, but next year. So I think absolutely, um, you know, we absolutely are collaborators. Um, as you said, we're part of the town. So we want to vision, we're all part of the town and we all support affordable housing. So we want to maximize the resources. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want to make sure before we move on to, to Nate uh, that uh, anybody else has an opportunity to make a comment or say anything. I'm not seeing. Well, I'll, you know, I'll just say quickly that the ARPA funds are are really unique in that they don't have some of the same restrictions as CPA or CDBG, you know, block grant funds. And so, you know, when you know looking at the VFW site, for instance, it's like, well, what what funds are appropriate there? And you know. There are probably a number of different funding sources, but you know we have to consider as we talk about this. You know what what are you know what could be good for design, for development, for construction, and so each each funding comes with some restrictions or you know strings attached. And so, you know, I think ARPA funds though are flexible and and um, you know, there is a deadline though, but I think they are you know more flexible than say block grant or even CPA. And so I think that just you know as we as trust members consider that, just remember you know if we start thinking how to layer funding on a project, whether it's trust fund, CPA, or other funds that, you know, each of those has their, you know, caveats with them. And, um, you know, so that's some of the conversation Dave was alluding to. I think, you know, the CPA committee is asking that as well. Like, okay, if, if Valley needs three quarters of a million and we give them half a million, where does the 250 come from? Or if we give them 300,000, how do we help them build up to the, the requested amount? And maybe it's a combination of, you know, three or four funding sources. Um, but, you know, I think that's something that may need to happen, as Dave mentioned, in the next month or so. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ashley, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was just, you know, it's it's a little, little bit hard for me to, like, think about all these projects. But also, I think we just need to think about, like, the people's lives that we're touching. Because even in, like, Ball Street, I forget how many units there are, but it's it's a relatively small amount that actually has affordable housing. Like... I forgot the percentage, but so if there was 24 units, I could look this up. We could look this up. Oh, well, only like 10 were actually affordable, right? So that's like helping 10 families out of 24 units. And I so, think it's 30 and 20, Ashley, but go ahead. Okay. Well, that's good. But I'm saying like, it's, I want to talk about what percent, like, because it's not like a project doesn't help. It's not an actual it's just a development. Some of it, some of it is actually helping, is affordable. A lot of it is just marketplace. People are just buying it. I think we should need to talk every single time about how many people are really, how many low-income people are really being helped with each project, because that's what matters. Lots of people are just getting market rate housing with their development, you know? And so it's like, we gotta talk about how many people we're helping, not just all the numbers. But yeah. 20 out of 30 is better than none, but it's like, I would like some 100%. I mean, hopefully that one that's the VFW is like 100% helping people because that's gonna be a, like a high percentage. So that's like, that seems like a priority. The, the more percentage affordable units or free, that's the better project. 
Yeah, if I could, and no, it's a great point. Um, I think sometimes um, we planners get a little, we, we get focused on the project and, and we, and the funding and the sites and the real estate and, and all the steps. And it's important to, to kind of step back sometimes and say, who are we trying to help? And how many more people can we get into housing in Amherst that is affordable to the, them as an individual or, or as a family? The, the one thing about um, any of these projects is that often the mix of, and I'm, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know here, but many times it's the market rate units that subsidize, help subsidize the, the affordable units. So it is challenging to get a 100%, you know, all, have all the units be be affordable and, and that's why we see these mixes, whether it's in Valley's project or Wayfinders. But but I, I again I think the project that we're envisioning for the VFW, um, all of those would hopefully be um, you know affordable and some of them set aside for veterans. But I think your point is well taken that um, we need to remember the people and the families we're trying to help. So uh <laughs> All right, I just want to pay attention to time. It's 8.47, go ahead, Carol. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to be brief, but I actually think there's another benefit to when it isn't all low income housing together. When it's mixed, that means that all the different kinds of people and different levels of income get to mix too. And, and so it helps end the kind of segregation that we have, it brings us together. In a way that's really important. It's been important for, for me personally in my life to live in those kinds of communities. And so I, it doesn't, I, I, I don't know. I don't think that there's no benefit. There is no social benefit also as well as the economic benefit that Dave just mentioned. And probably, and we shouldn't probably get off on this, but I just, I had to say something because I, I think, think there is also think, a social benefit. Right. I think some mixed, you know, income is a benefit i just think that maybe it could be 50 50 or something but it tends to be not that much, not that much. so I, I think one of the things that ashley you're saying which we've also been trying to uh, get a handle on is what's the actual number for amherst and um you know we've been trying to look at all of the data and george actually puts some data together um, but it's something to consider for the future maybe parking lot uh, or bicycle rack um, future discussion, but possibly a dashboard where we have all of the different developments, private, and how many are actual affordable and how many are market rate, so we can actually know. And so when you know we're presenting data to the CPAC or to whomever, um, that we actually have those numbers, so uh, we could be clearer on you know when we're supporting a project, what does this actually mean uh, in terms of numbers and families, single families or. or extended families, et cetera. So I'm gonna move no. us. I'm gonna move us to the next topic just because it's 849, but that's really a really important conversation that we'll put we'll we'll continue. Um, so Nate, do you want to talk to us about Strong Street? Where that's yeah, at? sure. You know the this has been an ongoing project for a bit and you know we did have the wetlands assessed and rare species as Dave mentioned and you know it looks promising. So you know, this is going to be a, a slow project. Um, you know, it looks like the site can be developed. Uh, we have, you know, some good preliminary assessments. Um, but, you know, as we looked at it, you know, it's not something that's going to yield a large number of units, right? I mean, you know, 10, 15 at most, right? It doesn't seem like it's the appropriate place for a large apartment building. Um, there are some complications with utilities and access. Um, but it's, you know, something that the town's going to continue to pursue. And so, uh, you know, I think that for now, I'm, you know, I, I could say we could take it off the trust agenda every every month, and it's something that we could provide updates on periodically. You know, we're still looking at uh, Dave and I are meeting with neighbors tomorrow, so there are some neighbors to the property that are interested in what's happening. You know, there are some owners that own property that bought into the subdivision when it was approved back many years ago, and their properties were never developed. Um, so we've met with them. And, you know, I think it's something that we're looking at how to move forward. You know, what, you know, is it something that the town would use, you know, ask trust money uh, to do design and development and we could bring it through permitting and then try to RFP it to a developer 
with the permit already in hand, or is it something that um, you know we could help with utilities and then have a developer take it over? And so, you know, we've approached a few and asked what you know what kind of scenarios would be best. But so I think it, it will move forward. It's just not a fast project and it's challenging. So, you know, I, I think it's a good thing, right? So if if at this point the environmental assessments were different, we would say let's just walk, right? We would say that this pro property is not. Uh, you know, viable for any development, but that's the opposite. So I mean, that's the good news. The, I guess what really is, is just a kind of a slower process to figure out what's appropriate on the site. And, you know, I mean, we were thinking, you know, home ownership units, um, you know, could be rental, but, you know, just, it's not a large number of units. So it's not something Actually, to your point, you know, most developers, right, there's an economies of scale or some number of units that makes it feasible. And so if we say, oh, we have a 10 to 15 unit project, most developers would not really be clamoring to, to do that. And so we're trying to figure out ways to incentivize it or make it feasible for someone to come in. Um, the town's typically not a developer, right? We can help with utilities and horizontal uh, infrastructure, but not typically, you know, actual building of, of residential units. So would would that be a potential site for something like habitat to step into or it could be out yeah, i spoke with habitat a long time ago and they you know they were concerned about the all the costs to actually just get utilities and road and everything into the site and so you know it's something that if there was funding for that if we could you know essentially make it more developer ready they would be interested in it so that's it's still a possibility it's just you know right now it's really a, a driveway with no utilities and you know, it'd be a, a pretty big project just to get the site ready to build on. And that's something that they, you know, they, if it, if it's at that point, they would take it, but they're not going to do that work either. Any other questions or comments? So Nate, what you just said really stresses why we need money. <laughs> I'm sorry, it, it really does stress why the trust needs to have available funds in order to support things like this. Um, but um, thank you. Um, I mean, I think the other consideration is what's the feasibility of possibly selling it and then using that money for other projects. Um, but that's something that we could probably take on at another meeting. Okay. Right, the town has a disposition policy that could, you know, be looked at. And so, you know, the, the trust, I think, has kind of still has the, you know, the ability to look at it. Um, you know, there isn't, you know, unlike Hickory Ridge, where there's some flat land along a street frontage, you know, most of this is wooded and up a steep slope. And so, right, maybe, maybe there's a sale of a, a lot or two, but there's really not too many other uses that, you know, we're not going to put a you know, for instance, a fire station up there or a senior center. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, right. I think Rob had mentioned that at, you know, you know, it could have been like a year ago when we were looking at this, you know, Rob had mentioned, oh, well, if there's one or two lots, could those sale of those on, at market rate help subsidize either the development of pro the property, the rest of the property or go to some other project. And so there's probably some considerations as we move through this. Absolutely. So I Oh, sorry, go ahead, Carol. I, I see, it seems to me that what you're saying is the environmental study is promising enough that you're not, that we're not ready, the town is not ready to give up on it as a possible place for housing, but the housing is probably not going to come as a project development. It may come much more like as what Allegra and what you were talking about. Maybe we are asked to bring in some services and then habitat pecks away at it one thing at a time or some other similar thing like that happens. And so from the trust's point of view, we will hear about it from you again if you think the trust can do something in that process to move it forward. Is that right? Yeah, that's a good summary. Thank good. you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Does anybody else have any comments or questions for Nate? We'll make sure I'm not missing anybody here and not seeing it from, okay, thank you. So now I'm going to go ahead and uh, move it on to Paul um, regarding uh, our filling our trust vacancies. I think you have some good news for us as well. 
Yeah, I think um, Angela set up some interview times for next week, I think. So is that what I just see it on my calendar. So we're, we're doing a whole bunch of interviews. It's, it's a good time of year for us to be doing interviews. So that will go then. What happens with that is that uh, I make the appointment, it goes to the TSO committee of the council and then to the full council. So I think there's one vacancy right now. That's right. Trust, yeah. Thank you. And thank you for moving that forward. And Carol will be representing us uh, uh, okay, on- Okay, good. Excellent. Any questions from anybody? All right. So I'm going to now move it on to Carol um, for public comments and other topics before we wrap up. And we have three minutes to wrap up. <laughs> I bet you we can do it. <laughs> I, again, an announcement that I think Nate had at the beginning of the agenda, but I, so anyway, Rita Farrell, our longtime wonderful person who's worked as a consultant for us is involved in town politics in Shutesbury and has, has, is no longer available to us. So if we need the kind of support that we got from her again in the future, we will have to find another person to get it from because she's, she's no longer available and we're really glad that we had her and hope that she does well in what she's doing now. Um, are there any public comments from anyone who is still here, who's still here? Still lots of people. <laughs> There's a number of people. There are one, two, three, four, five, six people, one of whom is our note taker, still remaining as attendees. And if anyone would like to make a comment, a public comment, please raise their hand. At this moment, I'm going to... Dave has his hand raised. <laughs> He's up. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I don't want to extend your meeting. I know you're trying to wrap, Carol, but um, this is a topic that I think I, I would like to come back and talk with you about at some future date. I know that you know we've had a great relationship with Rita through the years, been very effective. Um, the town requested and and um, um, was supported by the town council for some funds for for part time staff. And so I, I think having having a discussion about staff for the trust and staff for the town, dedicated staff for the trust and dedicated staff for the town, both focused, you know, exclusively on affordable housing makes a lot of sense to me. So I, I know we don't want to take time tonight, but I think we should have that conversation in in the next two months. Um, uh, I think there's some economies of scale there that we can we can capitalize on. And, and as Paul indicated, uh, we, we've we lost some staff on the second floor. So the next couple of months are gonna be very challenging for us. Nate is wonderful, uh, but Nate, I can tell you, he has a whole lot on his plate right now. So- um, I'm sure he does. Um, so let's, if, if I could, maybe in the, your January meeting, we could bring that, some ideas to you and we could talk about, you know, some of the needs you have, some of the needs the town has, and maybe there's a way to look at at um, your your funding that you've set aside in the past and the funding we got from CPAC and 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 be creative about it. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Well, we can put that on the agenda for January 12th, I think it is. Yep. And, um, and, for sure. and I think so that- So we will. And Ashley, yeah. go ahead. I, I, I second that or I totally support that. And also the first thing I want them to do is a cost analysis of why it's so expensive to get affordable housing like why is a unit so expensive and why is it what what can we spend and how efficient can we be to house the most amount of people and i totally want to hire that person <laughs> okay thanks <laughs> thank you um do we have any other public comment from anyone else who's who's either in the room or not yet in the room hands are not up i do not see any hands um, so I think we now have a couple of items on our future agenda. I don't have any items other than those we just put on the future agenda that weren't thought up in the last 48 hours. Can I put in a possible item on the future agenda? Sorry. Yes. Um, so I am also the co-chair of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, and we have been floating the idea of perhaps, um, co-hosting community listening sessions with different um, other agencies in town or committees in town that are doing 
you know, intersectional work with social justice. So one of the committees that we thought would be reasonable to perhaps host a listening session with would be the housing trust. So, oh, yeah, so do you, so you want to say more about that as an agenda, as a future agenda item, or you want the future agenda item to be to do that? Um, both. <laughs> All right. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. But I don't think we have any like details or anything really flushed out yet. So I think that, that perhaps when that's more concrete, if, if people would be willing to listen to some sort of pitch, then that would be sure in the future. Sure. All right. A future, but not the next. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Any, any, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, anything else? I have a, yeah. a quick uh, question for future as well. If maybe Paul, Nate, or Dave can comment on this in the future. Um, I believe Amherst is receiving opiate abatement funds. Is it, are we considering possibly using those funds to support behavioral health services for the VFW project? But that does not need to be answered now. Thank you. Anything else that anyone wants to say before, I guess we have to vote to adjourn, but I think we can do it with our thumbs. You, Is you, it, actually, actually, the chairs can just say, I declare that I just adjourn the meeting so you don't have to vote. All <laughs> right. I declare, <laughs> somebody says something really quick, that the meeting is adjourned at whatever Thank time you. it is, 9 0 Three. Five, three. Thank you all for your <laughs> participation and patience and everything else. And uh, see you on January 12th, unless I, I think that we were warned by Dave that we might need to have an additional meeting. And so that we might need to make some kind of talking about how all of the different funding things work together. So uh, I'm going to ask Dave if you want to do that to please give us as much notice as you possibly can so we can manage to have a quorum for you. And I'm just going to, we should just all be on notice that that might happen. So we might see you before January 12th. It, um, it, could, be, it could be January 1st if everyone's available on the 1st. <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> all if, right. you're hosting, if you're hosting <laughs> your house, I'll come with a mask. <laughs> Let's keep that as a tentative date. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.